Hello everyone, welcome to Downtown Tailoring. I'm so excited for today's video. I'm not sure if what I'm going to show you today is a technique or if it's magic. I don't want to say it's magic, but deep down, you know, I know that it's geometry. Even Pythagoras will be a little disappointed on me if I just say that it's magic, but I know that you will understand me when you see this beauty technique. I've been thinking to make this video for a long time because although this technique is so useful and so important, I haven't seen it before in any book, in any video or anywhere. This is why I think it's even more important that I show you today to you. And I know, I know, I have talked too much already. It's because I'm so excited and I promise you, I won't disappoint. In fact, if I delivered, I want you to do a favor for me and write in the comments, delivered. Because this is really good. So let's go. Let's say that you wanna make some garment on bias. We all know that managing the fabric just to make sure that your pieces will be cut on bias is a pain on, <coughs> you know. Another inconvenience is that you are going to waste so much material. And if it happens that you have to cut a long garment, the math you'll need to do, ugh, it's just a matter of sit down and cry. To skip all those problems, I use the little house bias technique. This is a technique where I prepare the fabric to be square yet unbiased. And I love it because it will give to the fabric stability and it will allow you to manage your fabric way easier. Let me show you how to do it. I have this fabric here and first of all, I'm going to iron it. Remember that anyways, it's always a good practice to iron your fabric before cutting it because the pattern will be more exact. It will be easier to manage. It even might shrink a little bit if you didn't wash it. I did wash myself this one. It's a silk, I should have dry cleaned it, but because it's vintage, you know, I just prefer to wash it and it was all good. Just a little running dye when you wash a uh, handmade silk. Now my fabric is all iron and I'm going to place it over the table. And this step is crucial to achieve the results you are looking for. I'm going to cut again this raw edge and I'm going to make sure my new edge will be completely perpendicular to the grain or selvage of the fabric. This you can do it in three ways. First, you can pull a thread or two just to make sure exactly where is the weft direction and then you can cut it around there. A second way is by taking your ruler, a ruler that you know that has a 90 degree angle and make sure to trace a perpendicular line to the salvage and cut. The third way can be a little tricky for many reasons. I don't wanna mention today because you know, but you can rip the fabric and then iron it. And if you need to, cut it again parallel to your rip. When you have your raw edge perfectly perpendicular to the selvage, you can then fold your fabric inside out. You are going to make sure that the two right sides of the fabric are facing each other. And now I'm going to pin all around of these raw edges. Then I'm going to my sewing machine to stitch this edge. Me, myself, I find that it's easier to sew at one inch or three eighths of the inch and then cut the excess of seam allowance, but you can go ahead and sew it at one quarter. Make sure to set your stitch length around two. You know, the shorter the stitch, the better, but you know, sometimes I feel like if the stitches are too, too, too short, it kind of reduce somewhat the length of the fabric if the tension is not perfect. That's why, you know, I set with the two. When you finish, you can cut the excess of material and iron it. 
First, I like to iron it flat and then I iron it with the seam open. I prefer to iron it first and cut it later as I have this strange self-love for my fingers, you know? I don't like burns, go figure. You can use pinky shear scissor to cut it or not, it's up to you. Now I'm going to place it over my table and I'm going to open the fabric forming this kind of little house and make sure that the seam is exactly in the center. And now the magic will start. Mom! Well, it's magical for me. Pinch and pin one of the corners and keep pinning. You know, I like to go a little further, at least until I pass this seam in the center of the house. And now I'm going back to my sewing machine and sew all the way down. Please notice that you will be sewing selvage with selvage from now on. Try to sew in the soft part of the fabric you want to leave the selvage out. It's just that sometimes selvage pull material on an inconvenient way. This is why it isn't great to have it on your garment. And as well, it's important to keep in mind that selvage will present itself in a different way on different fabrics. In this case, for example, my selvage had printed on this Thai silk hand woven. So I have to make sure when I sew in to keep this message out of my right side of the material, you know? When you reach the last pin, you will keep sewing and sewing and sewing until you don't have anything else to sew. At this point, um, always will be a good practice to be pinning your fabric all along to avoid one side slippering more than the other. But, you know, if you are confident that you will hold very well your fabric, you, you will be fine too. And keep in mind <laughs> that you are going to do a lot of sewing. Depends, of course, on how many meters of fabric you have. When you reach the end, go back to your table and you basically have your fabric ready. This is how you will see it from now on. It looks like a normal fabric placed double to the grain. You can iron your seams all along as you did with the first one. And you can as well cut out the excess of seam allowance. It depends, all cases are different. If you take a look of the selvage, you can see that they are running at 45 degree angles. That means that the edges are on true bias. Therefore, now I can use my patterns as if they were meant to be cut straight, but they will be cut on bias. Yes! Yes! For example, if you have a length problem with a long dress, now it's not a problem anymore. I love this little house bias technique because it reduces time, energy, brain power, and lots and lots and lots of fabric. Each time that you have to work a lot of fabric. And I know that you are thinking that working on bias is uneasy, but I'm gonna make a video for you demitifying bias. And I bet that you just want to run and get some fabric to try this technique. When you are cutting using the little house bias technique, you have to keep in mind where the seams are, on top and underneath. You don't want an undesirable seam. But anyway, I don't know if you have noticed that before, a lot of bias garments have those kind of cuts. This technique has been practicing for a long time. And I know just because I used to notice this on garments and I always wonder how it was made. You know, we were, as everybody else who works with bias, fighting with the fabric to cut as many true bias bow ties we could. I learned that technique about 10 years ago when I was helping a colleague to finish a big order she had of some bow ties for a shop. And then another colleague of us saw us and, you know, she went like, abracadabra. And we were like, 
And from that moment, you can't imagine how many ties and bow ties for wedding, scrunches, bows, and you know, garment in general, I have made using this technique. At this point, I know that you might have many questions. Please let me know in the comments. What do you think about it? If you have any question, if I delivered. So guys, I hope that you like this video. I really enjoy making it because I found that the little house bias technique is just fantastic. Bye.